adrenal gland it basically develops from mesonephros okay so adrenal gland development it basically takes place from the mesonephros around third to fourth week of gestation Okay, so now let's talk about the adrenal gland. The adrenal gland it basically develops from mesonephros. Okay, so adrenal gland development it basically takes place from the mesonephros around third to fourth week of gestation. Uh, if we talk about the differentiation of this, so the differentiation of the adrenal gland into the different zones that is glomerulus, reticularis, and fasciculata that basically is completed by eight to tenth week. So this zonulation is basically completed at around eight to tenth week. Now, birth weight, like when the child is born, the size of the adrenal gland is close to twice that of an adult. And this is really, really important. Okay, so when the child is born, the adrenal gland are of a bit bigger size. And because they are of a bit bigger size, there is a possibility that hemorrhage and all things can occur in this particular adrenal gland. So, yes, like uh, there can be hemorrhage in this adrenal gland. And to detect that, we have ultrasonography. That is one of the good investigations to look for hemorrhage inside the adrenal gland. Okay, so that is something which you need to understand. The birth weight of the adrenal gland when the child is born is around twice that of an adult and it grows till around three years of age. Okay, that is important. Now, other things, uh, it is around three to five centimeters in the greatest dimension. One centimeter is thick. The weight of the adrenal gland is five kgs, around five to six kgs. That is what is the weight. And that is basically same in the males and the females. So as we looked in the kidney, the size of the kidney was around 10 to 15 grams smaller in the females as compared to males. But there is no kind of set discrepancy in the males and the females as far as the adrenal gland is concerned. Now, I told you that the cortex, so yeah, we have the cortex and the medulla, right? So the cortex of the adrenal gland is something which is derived from the mesoderm and the medulla is basically derived from the ectoderm. That is what you need to understand. Uh, for this medulla, there is migration of the neural crest cells, which is leading to the formation of a adrenal medulla. This adrenal gland, it lies within the gerota's fascia and is basically yellow orange in color. So when we have the kidney, above the kidney, we have the gerota's fascia. We have a thin membrane, which is basically present between the adrenal and the kidney. But this adrenal gland is also covered with the gerota's fascia. That is what you need to understand. Now, let us talk about the differences between the left and the right side adrenal gland. When we talked about the kidney, I told you that the right kidney is the one which is located at the lower position. But when we talk about the adrenal, adrenal glands, it is the left adrenal which is basically situated at a lower position. So this goes against your logic. Okay, you will think that, okay, because of the liver, even the adrenal will be pushed down. That's not true. Here, the liver is there, no doubt. But here, the adrenal gland is located at a higher position. So on the right side, it is higher as compared to that of the, uh, of the left side, uh, right? And uh, yeah, that's fine. Now let's talk about the shape. So the shape is also a bit different. On the right side, the adrenal gland is triangular or pyramidal in shape. On the left side, the adrenal gland is crescentric or semilunar in shape. As you can, as you can see over here, this is lower than the right adrenal. That is important. That is really, really important. Please remember that. Okay. Now we have already covered this. Let's say if at all there is an ectopic kidney or the renal agenesis, what is going to happen to the adrenal? They are going to be at the normal position. Nothing is going to happen to them. Okay. Right. Now, when we talk about the adrenal, I told you that it is divided into the cortex and the medulla. The cortex can be subdivided into three zones, that is glomerulosa, fasciculata, and the reticularis. Okay. Now, out of this, if I ask you, which is the one which is having the maximum size out of these three zones, which is which zone is having the maximum size? It is the fasciculator. So fasciculator is the zone which is having the maximum size. Around 80% of the all the entire adrenal gland, it is basically made by the fasciculator. But if I ask you which of these zones is last to develop, so it is the reticularis. Reticularis is the zone which is basically last to develop. I hope you are able to understand this particular point. Guys. Okay, fasciculator is the having the largest side, but the reticularis is the one which is last to develop. Now, let's talk about the arterial supply of the adrenal gland. So, adrenals are basically supplied by the three arteries, the superior adrenal artery, middle adrenal artery, and the inferior adrenal artery. The superior adrenal artery, this is basically, this can be a branch of inferior phrenic artery most commonly it is a branch of your inferior phrenic but it can also arise from your aorta or the celiac axis and the intercostal artery but please remember most commonly it is a branch of your inferior phrenic artery okay right then we talk about the middle adrenal artery this is most of the times it is a branch of it is a direct branch of your aorta and when we talk about the inferior adrenal artery in the inferior it is basically a branch of your renal artery 
Please remember, adrenal is applied by the three arteries. Superior, mostly it is a branch of your inferior phrenic artery. It can also arise from aorta, celiac trunk, and the intercostal vessels as well. Okay, remember. Now, what about the arterial supply? So, when we talked about the kidney, I told you that it is having an end artery. But that is not true with adrenals. So, in the adrenals, this arter uh, arterial supply of the adrenal gland, it basically forms a plexus around this particular adrenal gland. So, because it is having uh, that particular plexus and it is having a lot of collaterals, even if you kind of ligate this particular artery, it is not going to cause devascularization of the adrenal gland. And that is the reason why you can perform partial adrenalectomy. Okay, the reason why we can proceed with that is because there is a complex collaterals of the plexus which will supply the adrenal gland even if you ligate a couple of arteries. Now, let's talk about the three patterns of the blood kind of distribution which we have over here. So, we have the capsular arteries which are basically supplying the capsule of the adrenal gland. Then we have a cortical sinusoidal capillaries which supply the cortex. So, they basically form a sinusoidal like there are the sinusoidal spaces inside the cortex and yeah, that is what is your cortical sinusoidal capillaries. And then we have a medullary artery. So medullary arteries basically supply the medulla. So this is important. Okay. So we have a different blood supply for the capsule, for the cortex and for the medulla. Capsule, it's fine. No issues. In the cortex, that particular arteries, they basically enter into the cortical sinusoidal, like they basically form the cortical sinusoidal capillaries. Okay. Right. Now, what happens to these sinusoidal capillaries? They again coalesce and then they go to the medulla. So, we'll talk about it. But this is how medulla actually has a dual blood supply. It is having a direct blood supply from the medullary arteries. At the same time, these cortical sinusoidal capillaries, they again join up and then they go to the medulla and then they kind of enter into the adrenal vein. Please remember this point. We will talk about this. So, yeah, here, medulla, medulla has a dual blood supply. How? Arterial blood from the medullary arterioles, obviously direct blood and the venous blood from the cortical sinusoidal capillaries. I just told you, these cortical sinus sinusoidal capillaries, they are going to join together, they are going to enter into the medulla, and then they are going to kind of enter into the systemic circulation. That is what you need to understand over here. Now, let's talk about this. Dual blood supply. Okay, why this is important? Why this is a big deal? So, dual blood supply to the adrenals is a big deal because this is something which is responsible for medullary production of catecholamines. Okay, because of this, these particular adrenal medulla, there is a formation of a catechol means because of this particular thing. I hope you are able to understand this. Right. Okay. Uh, venous drainage, it's kind of simple. So, we have a right adrenal uh, kind of vein and the left adrenal vein. But again, there is a bit of a difference over here. So, what is the difference when we talk about the left adrenal vein? That is a tributary of your renal vein. We have already talked about it. Okay. So, this basically drains into your left renal vein. But when we talk about the right adrenal vein, it is shorter and it is directly entering into your inferior vena cava. That is what you need to understand. That is the difference between them. I hope you understood this point. And this left adrenal vein is the reason that even if you accidentally go and ligate your left renal vein, still that particular kidney will not die because of these particular tributaries. Okay. Now, lastly, let's talk about the lymphatic uh, kind of anatomy. It is more or less similar to your uh, kind of uh, renal. Okay. So, let's talk about when we talk about the right. So, it basically goes to the light uh, lateral aortic nodes, but it can also directly enter into the thoracic duct and the posterior mediastinal nodes as well. When we talk about the left, it basically goes to the left lateral aortic nodes and the thoracic duct. I hope you get this point. Now, the lymphatic vessels drain only the cortex. Please remember these guys. These lymphatic vessels, they are draining only the cortex. They are not draining the medulla. And that is why we do not find catecholamines in the thoracic duct. Why don't we find the catecholamines in the thoracic duct? Because these lymphatics, they are not draining the medulla. I hope you got this particular point. Okay, right. Now, capsular lymphatic vessels pass directly to the thoracic duct. So, when I talked about this thoracic duct, there's not the entire gland is kind of, entire cortex is kind of draining into the thoracic duct. No, not really. It is the capsular lymphatic uh, kind of uh, vessel channels, which are basically present around this particular adrenal gland. These are the ones which enter into the thoracic duct without going through the lymph nodes. Okay. So, these are the ones which are directly entering into the thoracic duct. Now, let's talk about the innovations of the adrenal. So, innovation of the adrenal gland, it is important for the release of the catecholamines from the chromaffin cells of the medulla. Okay. That is why it is kind of essential. That is why it is essential, uh, necessary. So, sympathetic visceral nervous system, it is basically the main innovation of your adrenal gland. We are talking about the sympathetic system at this point of time. 
Okay, so uh, what happens is this medulla per se acts like a ganglion. We do know that it is basically like a ganglion. So the pre uh, like pre synaptic kind of neurons they come, they kind of synapse at this particular adrenal medulla, and that is how the catecholamines are kind of released over here. So why is this in a sympathetic innervation needed? Because because of uh, sympathetic innervation, if at all there is a sympathetic stimulation, only then these catecholamines can be released from the adrenal medulla. Okay.